Welcome to Back to the Bible. I am pastor and Bible teacher Nat Crawford, and it is Monday and probably the most challenging day of the week for many of us. But I'm here, you're here, and my friends Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney will be joining us as well. Together, we're going to look at our challenges, problems, and fears, those giants that stand before us. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to size them up in light of God's conquering power. Because God-sized giants require God-sized solutions. With that in mind, let's take a look at the ultimate example of a giant slayer. First Samuel 17, starting at verse 1. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, but you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear... He will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. It's easy to judge Saul for being so earthly-minded. It'd be easy to say, Dude, you are so focused on the appearance rather than the one who was really in charge of all outcomes. All you can see, Saul, is a giant outside. All you can see is a boy in front of you. Why are you taking your eyes off the one who can secure the victory? But you see, friends, his battle, it's our battle. God is completely faithful, and yet we forget his faithfulness. We get scared. We get paralyzed. And if we're honest, we begin to doubt God. I mean, yeah, sure, last week when that car repair came up, God supplied that extra $500. But now that your car is again in the shop, and now with $1,000 in repairs, will God really come through this time? Sure, yesterday, somebody dropped off a meal when you had no food in the fridge, but now it's a new day and you still don't have a paycheck till Friday. Will God really provide what you need today? Yeah, sure, maybe God restored your health in January. You recognize that. But is he really going to protect you from this virus that's spreading like wildfire? Look, whatever your giant is, whatever giant you're facing, don't forget God's faithfulness in the past. David didn't. David was so focused on God's faithfulness, he wouldn't take his eyes off of it. David, he was protected by God in the past. That's why David says that God... He will protect him in the future. David was protected from the lion. He was protected from the bear while he was just doing his daily routine of protecting the sheep. David knew of God's faithfulness. He focused on it. He focused on the truth, and he did not focus on the feelings. He did not focus on the giant. He focused on God. He held tightly to God's faithfulness, and he did not focus on the human giants. That is exactly what you and I need to do today. We need to stay focused on God's faithfulness. But also, when the giants come, we need to learn not to turn to our own talents, to our own solutions, to our own resources. Yes, we have them. God has provided those for us. But we have to remember that God-sized giants, they require God-sized solutions. Most of us are inclined to fix the problem. I'm a fixer. I want to fix the problem that I have. I want to fix the problem of my family members. I want to fix all the problems around me. We all do. So we begin to manipulate the situation. We try to look for human solutions. We look at all the silver bullets that the world offers, all the silver bullets that we can possibly muster. But our first response, 
our first response should be to look at the faithfulness of God in our own lives, to turn to God first, and then allow Him to provide and show us the resources. You see, our first response, like David, should be to turn to God, to focus on God and not the problem. Well, it is great to have my discussion partners back again, Arnie Cole, CEO of Back to the Bible, and author Kara Whitney. Arnie, the Bible is full of imagery for God. It says that God is like a mother hen who protects her chicks. God is like a fortress. Sometimes God is described as a rock or even a warrior. He's a peacemaker, and he's even been called a judge. What description of God brings you the most amount of comfort in times like these, and why? For me, God's like a warrior, and uh, we're in a battle, and normally it's, it's a battle against good versus evil, but now it, it, the stakes even seem higher with the health issues and all of that. So I like to picture God as the leader, as the warrior, and we're soldiers, and our job is just to follow the leader and uh, do what he tells us to do without questioning. And just onward and upward, you know? Yeah, that's a very popular one. And I think in times like this, it's very beneficial. What about you, Kara? I like the uh, the mother hen protecting her chicks because uh, mothers are detail-oriented. And uh, God is, is strong. He's a warrior. And I do lean on that. But uh, we forget, too, that he can be tender and detail-oriented. You know, like your mom, when you're cold and you realize she's packed your sweatshirt. Mm. I remember times when I'd be walking down the hill of the school, and instead of having to ride the bus home, she was standing there waiting for me to drive me home. Just those little details that God is involved in, so He's uh, he's got us in those as well. That gives me that warm, fuzzy feeling, for sure. Yeah, I've really grasped onto the Psalm 23, the, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, as I get older, you know, it's one of the Psalms you hear so much about, but when you pause and think about it, the patience of the shepherd is really comforting because I can be a lot like a dumb, stubborn sheep who keeps wandering away and keeps doing the same old things, but yet he is always there to watch over us, always there to protect us, and always to bring us back to the group when we wander. I've found a lot of comfort in that imagery. You know, I think the title Deliverer holds a lot of meaning for us today. He he delivers us from trials. He delivers us through the trials. He delivers us to growth, to peace, to hope. He delivers us into the love of Christ. Let's be honest, the Amazon Prime drivers, they cannot deliver as God does. I mean, they're great at delivering, but what, what they offer pales in comparison. So one more thing I want to discuss is David's reflection, his adoration, and his declaration of God's past faithfulness. He takes time to look back at God's deliverance with the lion and the bear. He adored God because of it. He then declared it to those watching. Why do you think he did this? And why do you think we should do this today? Kara, why don't you start? Well, I think it's critical, uh, especially in times when uh, things are uncertain, that you remember all the times God has shown up for you. And there's, I mean, probably several times where God's shown up and rescued you from something or carried you through something and you weren't even aware of it. But even the times we're aware of, if we think back on those, he's going to blow your mind every time. So that's, that's why I think it's critical. Yeah, and I I think it's always good to remember that we're victorious. He's victorious. We're victorious because of our relationship with Him, which really makes everything so much more exciting and so much easier to handle, at least from my perspective. We already won it. Yeah. Why do you think then, because God has been so faithful, and you and I, we we do have these testimonies of God's faithfulness and how He has delivered us and protected us and given us beyond what we deserve by His grace. Why do you think then we struggle so much with holding on to that and adoring it just like David did? Drama? I don't know. (laughs) I think part of the answer is because we're human and we forget and we... I think we trust God a lot in the big things of life, things that really matter, like our salvation. Like, I don't doubt God's faithfulness 
for my salvation. I know that he has it secured. There's nothing I can do that will break that bond and that promise of salvation. There's nothing that I can do that would jeopardize that. But yet, when I get that unexpected bill, when the health diagnosis is uncertain, when there's an issue with my spouse, those are the moments that I begin to doubt God's faithfulness. It's a fascinating piece of, I think, of our brokenness, but I also think it's part of our perspective and what we're focusing on. What what do you think about that? Yeah, I think we all have our breaking point. I think that's one thing that is uh, very clear to me, and that's huge as we go through life is to realize that. And instead of getting to that breaking point, we just have to turn it all over to the Lord. I mean, there is no other way. He's the only way through this. But we all have areas that we struggle in, that's for sure. They're called weaknesses. Kara, what about you? Are you uh, are you much like David, where you just are so focused on God that the problems of life don't distract you from him and his faithfulness and his past faithfulness to you? Or are you like the rest of us and you have your own struggles? Well, I'd like to think that... <laughs> That I don't have any of those things, but I I think concern is healthy, uh, but I think fear is unhealthy. So I'm concerned, but I trust God, and and um, there's not much more that you need than that, right? So yeah, and I think that's an important thing for our listeners to remember that concern is healthy, and there is a healthy fear that we all have. There are things that are dangerous and things that are challenges. And those are opportunities for us to rely on God. But a healthy concern, healthy fear is healthy if not expected. So, great perspective. David, Daniel, Joseph, and the many other biblical characters we're studying this month remind us how important it is to trust God regardless of our situation. Now, I am not saying that's easy, but choosing faith over anger or fear or any other emotion is absolutely vital to growing spiritually and experiencing a deeper relationship with God. That's why I wrote Win the Day, Daily Steps for Overcoming Anger and Fear. And today, I'd like to send this encouraging resource to you as a thank you for your gift to support Back to the Bible. Discover what it means to experience true peace and move forward in faith even in the midst of a confusing and chaotic world. Call today to request your copy of Win the Day, Daily Steps for Overcoming Anger and Fear. Here's the number, 1-800-759-2425. Again, that's 1-800-759-2425. Now, if you prefer to give online, visit us at backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. All right, well, let's return to our study. Well, as I said before, our first response, like David, should be to turn to God, to focus on God and not the problem. One way to focus on God and not the problem is to turn to Him in prayer, as Philippians 4, 6-7 says. Philippians says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension— will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My kids know this verse by heart. They say the paraphrased version, which is, worry about nothing, pray about everything. If I were to change it to fit our context today, it'd be turn from your giant and turn to God. That's kind of the application of that verse. Turn from your giant and turn to God. Worry about nothing and pray about everything. That's it. Turn from your giant and turn to God. David, obviously, he had no concept of Philippians 4, 6 through 7, but he exemplified the reality of it. He was aware of God's size and the ability to conquer the giant. He was also aware of the faithfulness of God in his past when he fought the wild animals. This uncircumcised Philistine was no different. Yes, he was big, but God is far bigger. Look, Saul hid and he worried. David, he stepped up with God by his side. But would that be enough? I mean, in a scene just like WrestleMania 2, where Hulk Hogan was head and shoulder below Andre the Giant. Here, David, he is standing head and shoulder below Goliath. 
Goliath, he throws insults against David like he was prepared to hurl his giant spear. But David does not back down. Instead, he says this, beginning in verse 45. He says, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The trash talking, it was done by Goliath. The truth dropping, though, was complete by David. I love it. The the moment had come. No more talking. No more hiding. It was time to face the giant and leave the consequences to God. So David, he runs towards Goliath, and Goliath, he draws his giant spear. David grabbed his shepherd's weapon. He had his sling in hand to drive away the wild beast, that sling and the stones. He quickly planted his feet. He twirled his sling and cast the stone, and it hit Goliath square in the head, and in an instant, the battle was over. The giant dropped his spear because the stone sank deep into the giant's forehead. The battle was won. The same giant that petrified King Saul, he was the same giant that fell at the foot of the shepherd David. Same giant, different reaction, far different outcomes. You see, God's people can defeat their giants by acting in faith in God. I'm going to say that again. God's people can defeat their giants by acting in faith in God. Peter, he could walk on water when he kept his eyes on Christ. It was possible by faith in action through God. Jericho? Jericho was brought down to rubble not by a classic siege, but by faith in action through God. The Philistines and their giant were brought to defeat not by crafty diplomacy or clever strategy, not by special armor, but by faith in action through God. David came to his giant in the name of the Lord. Friends, what is your giant today? What's your giant? What giant are you facing today? We all have them. Maybe you've been like Saul, cowering in fear. You're allowing the taunts to overwhelm you. Yes, I get it. Your giant, it's big, it's real, and it's scary. But listen to me. God is truly bigger. Your addiction your debt, your relationship hurts, your disappointments, your shattered dreams, the virus, whatever it is you're facing today, those giants are real. But listen to me, God is bigger. COVID-19, it's a big invisible giant that is rocking our world. It's rocking our economy. It's rocking the marketplace and it's rocking people's health. But I promise you, God is bigger and he will always be bigger. God is not asking you or me to act foolishly. God is not asking us to walk into harm's way. God is, however, asking us to trust him, to have a heart for God just like David did. He's asking us to turn from our giants and turn to him, to worry about nothing and to pray about everything. I promise you, though, he is not asking for perfection in our actions in the face of trials. We'll never do it. He doesn't expect it. What he is asking for, however, is dependence upon him and dependence upon his grace and mercy. Friends, remember, people will see what you really believe, not in what you say, but in how you act and how you react to the events, to the giants in your lives. Allow him God, our Heavenly Father, to defeat your giant today. Allow him to take on whatever giant it is you're facing. Turn from the giant and turn to God. How? If you're struggling today, if you've been hiding in the baggage like King Saul, it's fine. Confess your doubts to God. 
God won't turn away from you because of your doubt. He will draw closer to you through it. He wants you to be open and intimate and honest with him. When you admit your doubts, you can draw closer to him. If you've sinned because of your fear, I promise you, God is faithful to forgive you and restore the relationship. All you have to do is confess it and turn back to him. Second, call out to God. Call out to God to show you what you need to do. Yes, it likely won't be easy. It will take an act of faith. It's likely not going to be what you want to do, but it will be what you need to do to be dependent upon him. But just like David, it all comes down to your heart. David, he had a heart for God. He loved God. He trusted God. He kept his focus on God. If you want to be like the shepherd, David, if you want to conquer the giants in your life today, if you want to stop hiding in fear, you realize you can't just wish it away. You can't just hunker down and think the giant will go away. It'll still be there. You know that and I know that. It won't work just scanning Facebook or Twitter or Instagram all day. It won't work to binge watch YouTube shows or Netflix, none of those things are going to remove the fear. None of those things are going to deal with the giant, and none of those things are going to develop a heart for God. Do you trust God? Do you love God? Are you pursuing Christ? If not, facing your giants will be really hard. David acted by faith in God. The giant was defeated. Your giants will be too, but only when you have a heart for God. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground over the past three days. We know we're going to face giants. It's inevitable. We're going to have challenges and giants. We are able to prepare for them. We know we are to be aware that they're going to happen. But we have choices to make. People can defeat their giants by acting in faith in God. And that faith is cultivated by having a heart for Him. Arnie and Kara, what are your big takeaways from the story of David and Goliath? Well, uh, you know, when you go into Scripture and you read about just that whole battle and what Goliath was wearing, he had his brass helmet and he was covered pretty much head to toe in bronze. And then you hear, too, he had this shield bearer that's before him. And, you know, David put on this worldly armor and uh, and it just it didn't fit. So here comes uh, a handful of rocks, a sling. And then I think it's important to realize that he didn't have a shield bearer. He had a shield of faith. And that if we have faith and we trust God that he's going to carry us through the battles that we're in, these spiritual battles that we don't even know are going on, if we wear that shield of faith and we armor up with those things, there's that battle between the opposing spiritual kingdoms that there's a reason for that armor and to keep it on. That's That was my takeaway, just the, the significance of the armor. Right. And I think you bring up an important point for all of us today. Our real battle lies in the spiritual realm. Yes, we have physical problems going on. We have physical giants uh, that, are, that manifest themselves in monetary problems or relational problems. But the reality is it is all a spiritual battle. That is where the battles are really fought, on our knees and in our faith with God. I think that's a great perspective. Arnie, what about you? What are your big takeaways from the story of David and Goliath? Yeah, I think as a Christ follower now, it's very exciting for me because it gives me this thing about I can do all things with God, with God focusing on Jesus. Anything he wants me to do, he can make it happen. It's not about me. It's about him. And that's what I get out of this story. I, I think it's tremendously awesome because we all have giants in our lives. We all have those impossible things that we just think we can't get through. And yet, with Jesus, with our focus on Him, it's a complete game changer. I think it's important, too, Arnie brings that up, it's not about us, to realize we're created not so God can make us known and to give us good things. We're here to make God known, to know Him and make Him known. And so that's exciting because He's given us the ability to do that in whatever it is that He's 
created us to do. You know, some people are good at this or that or or whatever, but it's always about making God known in the battles as well. So if you're going through a battle, to use that battle to make him known and how good he is. Yeah, I really agree with that. And in my mind, God doesn't need me to do anything, but follow him, focus on him, and love him. He doesn't need me to accomplish anything. So with that in mind, he gets the perspective in the right place. It's all about him, and the victory is for him, not for us. Yeah, the main player in this, the main character in the story of David and Goliath, it's not David and it's not Goliath. It's, in fact, God because of his faithfulness and his delivery of David and the army. That's exactly right. But, Nat, you pastors tend to focus a lot on David and not so much focus on God, it seems like. I mean, everybody remembers David and Goliath and David beating Goliath, not God beating Goliath. I mean, there is that... um, focus on David, I think, is very, very strong. And I think that's true. Part of it is because that God, even though he doesn't need us, as you said, he still asks us to be part of of the play. He still asks us to be involved in the divine drama that's playing out today. He, he Again, it's by grace that we get to be part of this at all. And so, though, yes, we could sit idly, God has asked us to not sit on the sidelines, but to instead be in the battle and be involved and allow him to work through our weaknesses. And we see that displayed in the story of David and Goliath. But good, I think that's a good perspective. Well, and Wow, Kara, I'm impressed with this young guy. I set it up and he drove it home. I mean, I wow. Know, right? <laughs> that's kind of scary. <laughs> well, I, I seem to find sometimes David's faith intimidating because I... I'll be honest, I'd be tempted to put on some of that uh, armor that really didn't fit me and uh, and go that route. So I think it's a, a test of, of your faith. It makes you a little uneasy that he just grabbed a few stones in a slingshot. Uh, I think we'd all be tempted to grab at least a sword or something, even if it was too big and it didn't fit, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think that's such a good perspective, though, because God, he gives us spiritual gifts that are for a purpose and for building up the you know the body of Christ and for service in the church but we shouldn't be wanting what someone else has and we shouldn't be desiring to use those gifts that someone else has God has given us unique spiritual gifts and he's also given us unique personality and experiences and all these different pieces of the puzzle that are for us and God uses those and I talk a lot about that with outreach especially. If you have a certain personality, if you're an introvert, God's not asking you to go to a party and work a room for outreach. That's not God. What's, what he's asking you to do. He's asking you to leverage how God has wired you, how he has given you experiences, and the natural interest that you have to further his kingdom and to share the gospel. And, and David, he used what he was comfortable with, what God had equipped him with, and there were other options, but he goes, no, this is how, this is what I'm experienced with, this is what I'm good at, and God said, run with it. You know, God's asking us to do the same thing today, whether it's in the area of outreach or in the realm of our ministry context, whatever it is, God's given you what you need, and we shouldn't be longing so much for what other people have or what their gifts are and, and things like that. Well, or trying to put yourself into a place you don't fit. So if you're, Bingo. yeah, if you if you want to work for God, just wait. He's going to ask you, and he, if you're in the Word, He's equipping you. But don't put yourself in uh, some missionary trip just because you think that's what you think you should be doing in order to work for God. Just wait, because you're probably not equipped and you're not good in whatever it is you think you are. And I think that's a perfect um, segue into maybe a one-size-fits-all mentality we have, because I think the key to all of this and the story of David and Goliath is the issue of the heart. You know, we know that David was a man after God's own heart, but we also know David was a sinner just like us. I mean, if you go through the whole story of David, he committed some doozies, you know. He he engages with a woman who's already married. You know, he would have her husband basically killed because of the affair to cover up his sin. Uh, He would sit idly while his family members are engaging in some really gross behavior. 
and yet we know that he still loved God and he was repentant through it all. So he developed a heart for God, even though he was an imperfect man. But we today need to develop this heart for God, but there's really not a one size fits all, or at least we should not prescribe that. I think that's unfair. So I want to ask you guys first, how have you developed a a heart for God like David had? Well, I really understand the gift that Jesus gave me. Um, And so anytime I feel like I'm uh, in any sort of a doubt or straying off a path or anything, I just, I go back to my first love. It's Jesus Christ. And then I just think about the incredible amount of grace that he gives me. And I mean, that fires you up. Yeah, I'd I'd totally agree with that. And when you think of what Jesus did for yourself, for me personally, it just really fires me up to want to give this gift to someone else, if that's even possible, and share it Mm -hmm. and uh, get the word out there, because it truly is life transformation. So David's battle over the giant is, uh, and David certainly wasn't perfect, which is also helpful because I'm certainly not perfect, but victory is just something that is so awesome, especially when it comes to your spiritual life. So what would you say to our listeners today who they're recognizing, you know what, they are struggling in the battle, they have not developed that heart for God like they should, and they're wanting to do so. What advice would you give them today? Uh, get to know Him. I mean, take time to be in the Word and and get to know God. You know, my my brain, and I'm sure we'll talk about apologetics uh, more at some point, but my brain felt that everything was true, but I had to get my heart in the game, and it took a, a long time to do that. It wasn't until I saw my true need that I wasn't in control and got to the part where I, I didn't want to be. And so to be able to just hand that over to God, literally 1 Peter 5, 7, just cast my cares on Him. I would say it's just getting in the Word and getting to know God, because then you'll, I just think you'll fall in love with your heart, because that's what faith is. I mean, you can have all the head knowledge you want, but you have to come to Him with your heart. I, I heard a teacher once say it's it's uh, it, there are three pieces to our faith. We have the head, the intellect, where we learn about God, and we begin to study His Word, and we begin to get a framework for theology, but the intellect. But then it comes down to the heart or the emotion, like where we experience God, and we, we can feel His presence, and we begin to experience the whole relationship like we would with a spouse or a dear friend. But then it's also a matter of the will. You know, once those pieces are all coming together, we have to then be willing to put it into action, right? Talk is cheap. We can say we know God. We can say that we love God. But until we're willing to show it, I mean, it's not say it's not real, but it's not coming to full fruition. And that's where all three pieces have to come into play. Arnie, I've got a question for you based on what Kara said. She said, we need to get into God's Word. Now, pastors, as you know, are guilty as sin for saying, you got to get into God's Word. You got to get into God's Word. You got to get into God's Word. And what do they inevitably say afterwards? How? Where? What's the method? Help me out. How would you coach our listeners who are saying, I know I need to get into God's Word, but what do I do? So the key, and pastors do talk about Matter of fact, my grandma used to say, read your Bible, stupid. So it's, <laughs> it's like, but as um, our research team here at the Center for Bible Engagement, it's been around since 2004. What we found is if you want life transformation, if you want to just grow spiritually, Move closer to Jesus today than you were yesterday. The best way is to engage your Bible. And when we say engage your Bible, we mean read what it has to say, reflect, and then respond it into your life. Your life will look radically different, not only look, but will be radically different than anybody else in the world. And you will have success in your relationship with Jesus like nothing else ever before. And it makes sense because it's a physical, you know, you have to eat, you have to feed your body. If you don't, you become weak and bad things happen. It's the same spiritually. So if you are struggling to know God better, you you know of Him, but you want to know Him better, you want to develop a heart for God, we would encourage you here at Back to the Bible to check out our Go Tandem app 
get on that daily feed of verses, get in a Bible reading plan, and allow the Word of God to change you day by day and moment by moment. Well, I trust the study of David has ministered to you, and I pray you feel encouraged and ready to face your giants with a heart for God. Tomorrow, we'll continue in our series, Choosing Faith Over Fear, with a look at three New Testament characters, but one I promise you will never look at the same way again. Until then, stand firm, stand faithful, stand on God's Word. I'm Nat Crawford, and you've been listening to Back to the Bible. If today's episode has helped you move forward in faith, be sure to share it with a friend. And would you consider leaving a rating or review? We'd love to hear from you.